rapidly to get through all that all the slides and information. I'm going to try to do the same thing. Uh, I hope I don't go too fast, but there's a lot to share, and I you know want to stay within our time frame. You're right; it is hard to advance this thing. It doesn't work the normal way. There we go. So, real quickly, I think a lot of you are familiar uh, with the Archie Carr National Wildlife Refuge, and um, uh, just to you know put it out there, uh, Archie Carr is actually the the godfather of sea turtles, you know, in his day in the 50s and 60s and 70s and even into the 80s, he was the world's leading authority on sea turtles. Um, he wrote The Windward Road, which, which sort of alerted the world to the plight of sea turtles in the 1950s. And that directly led to the formation of our organization, which was um, uh, organized under the scientific direction of Dr. Carr. Um, there were some other philanthropists involved in the formation of the organization. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, in terms of the scientific direction and conservation mission of the organization, it, it really was Archie Carr's group. And so we're doing our best to continue his mission and vision and um, uh, doing, I think, a good job today. <clears throat> so the Sea Turtle Conservancy is obviously focused on sea turtles specifically. Um, for a lot of the organization's history, we were known as the Caribbean Conservation Corporation, or the CCC. Um, I, uh, I, <clears throat> I convinced the board to change the name in 2010 because it didn't say anything about sea turtles. And, and it was hard to, you know, raise money and, and, you know, have elected officials and others really understand what we were all about with this old name. Um, so we did change our name in 2010, but we have always been focused on sea turtles and their habitats um, and achieving that mission through research, conservation, education, uh, a lot of training programs for young biologists. Uh, and, and we too take science and turn it into action. Uh, and, and, and we are an advocacy organization. We'll, we'll get involved in lobbying, um, trying to affect change of policy occasionally, not, although somewhat rarely, we'll sue people when they deserve to be sued. Uh, maybe not people, in, you know, entities or the government. But um, we, we try to do what it takes to, you know, to make sure these animals and their habitats are being protected. <clears throat> we work, uh, we're of course based in Florida, but we, uh, we have uh, pretty substantial programs in Costa Rica Panama, Bermuda. Uh, about six years ago, we were able to get into Cuba and form some partnerships with researchers there to uh, make sure they were doing the best they could to protect sea turtles. And, and um, we're active in the Eastern Caribbean as well. I'm gonna focus uh, this talk mostly on Florida, obviously the, the kinds of things that the, the Community Foundation for Brevard supports. Um, but Florida is incredibly important globally for sea turtles. Um, if you look just at the United States, over 90% of all sea turtle nesting is occurring on our beaches. Uh, and, and that's concentrated on the central East Coast in Brevard, Indian River, you know, down to Palm Beach, but specifically in Brevard County. And that's why the Archie Carr Refuge was established here. Uh, and, and we were involved in the establishment of the refuge uh, using data that, that we had helped collect even before Dr. Earhart started working there with UCF and combining his and his team's data, we were able to convince Congress to, to initiate a massive land buying program to create our nation's first and only national wildlife refuge specifically for sea turtles. Uh, and, it, and it bears Dr. Carr's name. Of course, we have a, um, an incredible partnership with Brevard County and the Brevard County Eels Program, and Environmentally Endangered Lands Program. Um, they own the Barrier Island Center, the county does, and we jointly operate the facility with their staff. So they were looking for a partner to come in that could provide you know, financial support for exhibits, for events, provide staffing. Um, uh, organized volunteers. And so we've been doing that since the facility opened in 2008. And honestly, for years prior to that, behind the scenes, 
we were working with the county to get them to, to build this. You know, it takes a lot of work to convince the county to put this kind of money into a facility and, and, and we were doing that. <clears throat> um, at the Barrier Island Center, there are wonderful exhibits. Uh, you know, it, it used to be called, we used to and still refer to it as the Barrier Island Ecosystem Center. So while it's in the Archie Carr Refuge and, and a major focus is sea turtles, it's also raising awareness among local youth, uh, local residents, visitors about the entire ecosystem. You don't protect sea turtles without protecting the ecosystem. Um, so uh, the facility does that. And, and you know we have wonderful programs for kids all the time. Uh, especially pre-COVID, and I know we'll get back there, just daily visits by school groups, and, and it's, that's starting up again now. But uh, it's an incredible, uh, vibrant place uh, for kids um, and is, is heavily visited um, and, uh, and, and will be again soon. Uh, we, we run a lot of stewardship programs for the local community um, just to get people out into the refuge and on the lagoon uh, to learn about the resource, to learn about the issues affecting turtles and the habitat. Um, there are some habitat restoration programs. We do special events that, you know, bring people out into the habitat. Um, and um, obviously, you know, the overall goal here is to develop uh, uh, an ethic of conservation in this community. Uh, the Archie Carr Refuge is really unique in that it's a patchwork of public and private land. You know, it's not just a, you can't just put a border fence around the refuge and protect it. People live in this refuge. So you have to have the buy-in, the participation of everyone that lives there <clears throat> and it's working. You know, there are very key things that have to be done to protect sea turtles. And, and that beach is pretty well developed. I mean, mostly single family homes. But if you go out on the Archie Car Refuge at night, it's dark. And that takes community participation. And that's something that we continue to, to grow and foster at the Barrier Island Center. Um, we, this past uh, summer, uh, we've done uh, eco camps, you know, for kids for a long time. Um, this past summer, as a, a brainchild of our education outreach coordinator, uh, Sarah Rhodes Ondi, some of you may be familiar with, She's really passionate about um, providing mentorship programs and, and, and STEM career training and motivation uh, for diverse groups of kids who might not otherwise get that experience. So she put together just a wonderful Sea Turtle Tech STEM mentorship program, uh, uh, working with five different clubs that, that deal with um, you know, underserved communities. And it was an incredible program. Uh, we got people out into the refuge. They, they were building and operating drones and using virtual reality equipment to learn how you could do science with drones. Um, the underwater um, uh, mechanical, uh, um, I forget what they're called, but uh, you know, UAVs where you build these things then go into water and, and collect different data. They were doing that on site at the, at the center. And we, uh, also involved the kids in our uh, satellite tracking of the sea turtles. So they got to come out and participate with us as we um, located and then put satellite transmitters on turtles. But the, the goal really is to ultimately foster the next generation of, of young, uh, inspired conservation and science leaders and uh, try to get people from communities that might otherwise look at those careers as a possibility for them and uh, it was really successful. Uh, uh, coinciding with that was uh, a more advanced uh, involvement program for uh, a couple of college kids and a couple of high school kids who um, served as sort of uh, mentors during the, the Turtle Tech program, but they also themselves just got to get hands-on involved with every aspect of operating the Barrier Island Center. Um, and uh, we helped build their confidence to, to pursue careers in the STEM, pro, in the STEM sciences. <clears throat> Another thing that we do and have been doing for the last 15 or 16 years is the Tour to Turtles. Um, it combines our 
uh, research into the migratory movements of turtles with a, a fun online education program. Uh, this is something that the, uh, the Community Foundation has supported uh, along with other activities at the Barrier Island Center for a number of years. Um, we, you know, prior to COVID, we would get thousands of people to come out and, and watch the release of turtles that you could then follow along online. Um, and uh, so anybody in the world could, could watch this mock race of turtles um, take place. Um, the, the, the race is actually seeing which turtle could travel the furthest over the course of six, uh, of, excuse me, of three months. So there's a legitimate race to it. And uh, each one of our turtle sponsors would name names their turtle and, and then of course cheers on their animal. Um, here's my, uh, we keep track of the distances traveled. This is actually the current race. It's underway right now. And um, you can see we have Barba Streisand is uh, uh, kind of kicking everyone's rear ends there. But, um, you know, there's still a, a, over a month left. And um, a lot of these turtles are just haven't really begun their migration yet. So in that last month or so, you'll see a lot of movement in the leaderboard. But there are honestly hundreds of thousands of people around the world that log on on a regular basis to see what's going on in the Tour de Turtles and who's in the lead and cheering on their favorite turtle. And in the process, learning about these animals and the different things affecting them. So each, each turtle has its own dedicated page. You can see its map. Uh, you can learn about that particular species. Each turtle is racing to raise awareness about a cause related to turtle conservation. Maybe it's plastics in the marine environment or seat lighting on the beach, what's a problem with that? So um, it's a great way to get people engaged in something that's fun. Uh, they keep coming back and, and there are lots of resources for the individual as well as for teachers to use this program in the classroom to uh, motivate people to learn about ecosystem issues and threats to turtles and, and other habitat. <clears throat> and of course, it's part of a, a fundamental research into what's going on with turtles. Um, this is a composite of all the maps of turtles that we've tracked from the Archie Carr Refuge over the years. And you can, some really clear things are coming into focus. Um, obviously the importance of that East Coast migratory corridor that goes all the way up into the Chesapeake Bay area. The fact that some of these turtles leave our beaches and take up residency uh, off Chesapeake Bay at, for much of the year before they migrate back and nest. <clears throat> the, uh, a lot of different places in the Bahamas are really important foraging sites for the turtles that, uh, that nest in the refuge. And they also go around Florida and take up residency on the near shore regions of our Gulf Coast. So, you know, as the Sea Turtle Conservancy does work all around the world, uh, on the Gulf Coast, on the West Coast of Florida. Um, every bit of that work is important to the protection of the Archie Carr Refuge and the resources of Brevard County because they come back there and they go away. So it's, uh, it takes a lot of uh, coordination with different governments and different communities to protect what we consider the turtles of the Archie Carr Refuge. Even the work that we do in Panama and Costa Rica is vital to the Indian River Lagoon because many of those juvenile turtles that are uh, taking up residency there actually hatch at, at beaches in Costa Rica and Panama uh, and, and elsewhere. So um, we are international for sea turtles and you kind of need to be. <clears throat> um, Want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, our work trying to make sure our beaches are darker uh, for sea turtles. Um, we, we do a lot of training with uh, code enforcement officials around the state, making, raising awareness about the different technologies of lighting that's available to eliminate the, the problem of disorientation of hatchlings. The hatchlings you know, emerge from their nests, they're attracted to the brighter horizon, so they go the wrong way. Well, there's, there's all kinds of wonderful products available now that uh, provide light that's in the longer wavelength spectrum, which the turtles don't respond to as much. It's, it's well shielded, 
it's it's lower to the ground, and yet it still provides all the light we as people need for safety and security. And um, uh, there's just some great innovation to solve this problem of lighting disorientation on turtles and other wildlife. <clears throat> we have a, a lighting retrofit program where we work directly with, <clears throat> excuse me, um, beachfront property owners to evaluate lighting problems. We'll design, we have a team of four people, their full-time job is to evaluate lights, work with property owners, design a retrofit, and in many cases, we can actually pay for the retrofit. How is that possible? Well, we've applied for and received support um, with funding from the BP oil spill. There's a lot of money out there to mitigate for the, the damage that was done by the oil spill, and sea turtles were greatly affected by that spill. So there's a, a significant amount of money that was made available to improve survivorship of sea turtles to offset the harm caused by the spill. And we run a major lighting retrofit program around Florida with those funds. Um, <clears throat> right now, we're mostly focused on the Gulf Coast, but we have done a lot on the East Coast and even in the the, the Melbourne, uh, Indian River County region, and we hope to do more um, uh, in the not too distant future. But this is a quick look at what this looks like. This is actually from Daytona Beach. You know, we, these, these high rise condos, people put spotlights to light up the side of the building, I guess for passing ships to see the, the buildings at sea. I, I don't know exactly why that's necessary, but you see it all the time, and that is a major problem for sea turtles. But we can fix that. Um, we can we can install the right kinds of light on pool decks, walkways, balconies, you name it, and really make a difference for sea turtles on, on even on big developments. Here's another example from the Gulf Coast. I mean, that monstros monstrosity was attracting a lot of turtles, and now it's not. And we've done hundreds of these. <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize that, that we um, really established the sea turtle license plate. This young critter right here, and, and even here, it was me in uh, the, the early 90s. Um, I helped lead the campaign to create the license plate. And um, there's Lawton Childs signing it uh, into effect. Um, here's a young Charlie Crist when he was a, a, an early senator in the legislature. And um, anyway, it's, it's been a real important um, contribution to sea turtle conservation in Florida. Um, we initiated this campaign to create the tag because the state's Marine Turtle Protection Program did not have a funding source. So it was a, it, it, we were scurrying every year to get the legislature to appropriate a little bit of money to keep the Marine Turtle Program going, which deals with permitting and an oversight of development and looks at impacts to turtles and um, it was just struggling to survive. And so we created this tag not to raise money for our organization as, as a lot of tags do now. They support sp a specific nonprofit. We did it to provide uh, uh, money for a state program that wouldn't require tax dollars and could reliably support this program. Um, and it's been successful. Um, there are well over 100 tags in Florida. Um, these are the latest numbers on sales. Um, it is uh, firmly in third place. And uh, by the end of this month, we will pass the University of Florida in sales. Um, so uh, we, we would have been number one if not for this Johnny Come Lately, the endless summer tag, kind of burst onto the scene about three or four years ago. And it just tapped into people's identity in Florida with the surf surfing culture. Um, I surf myself and I get it, but um, they really did uh, shoot to the top pretty quickly. But uh, we're going we're gonna to take hold of second place. Um, and that, you know, that competition is just, you know, lighthearted. It's really ultimately about raising money for a really important cause. Um, so where does the money go? 70% uh, of it goes to the Fish and Wildlife Commission. 30% is set aside for a grants program that um, uh, has to be spent in Florida uh, for Florida-based nonprofits, research institutions, and um, local governments. 
So coastal governments can apply for money as well. Um, when we set the program up, we actually set it up so that STC itself administers that grants program. So we receive initially that 30% and then we give it back out in grants. And a lot of it does go to the, the Brevard County area. I mean, obviously the region is so important to sea turtles. You know, we're able to give grants almost every year to UCF, the, the Brevard County Eels Program, the Brevard Zoo, in-water research entities, the Sea Turtle Preservation Society, and lots more. And as the sales continue to go up, we're, we're now at a point where we have about, you know, you know over $400,000 a year to award in, in financial support for sea turtle work specifically in Florida. <clears throat> It doesn't, so you can't spend any of that money on, on policy work though. That, that's, that's one thing the legislature would not let us do. So any of this work to influence legislation, influence policy, no, no go. It's gotta be you know, education, research, direct conservation, which is important, but it leaves unfunded some, some things that need to happen. And so we have to raise money in other ways for those things. <clears throat> uh, we also do a lot of public education and, and awareness about just the issue of climate change and how it's impacting our state and sea turtles and beaches. Uh, we produced a, a, a video series um, called Ahead of the Tide um, in which lots of elected officials, scientists, experts, um, even Carl Hyacin is, is interviewed in this piece talking about the, the conflict between beachfront living and development and sea level rise. And, and what the future is gonna look like if we don't start making some big changes. So it's another way that we're trying to get the word out there about these issues. How am I doing on time? I, I can't hear you. I think it might be good to Wrap maybe it up. conclude, yeah, shortly and then okay. so we can have a chance to ask a question or two. Yeah, that, that was my last slide anyway. So oh, okay. <laughs> I have a few more that I, I kept in just in case I had more time, but uh, I'll stop there. Great. Well, we'll open it up, yeah, for questions and maybe, yes, there we go. Perfect. Um, does anyone have a question that's burning? Oh, Peter there, go ahead. <laughs> Me again. Okay. Um, thank you, David. That was a wonderful presentation also. Um, what do you see uh, happening to the beach that the turtle depends upon to lay eggs with the rising sea level, which I understand uh, will get to be five feet. Well, I see in many places the beach disappearing. Um, and, and, and the conflict really is that people who own property on the beach, understandably, want to protect that property. And uh, they're, they're building hard structures, armoring seawalls, things like that, in many cases, to protect that property and um, rising sea and hard structures don't allow for sandy beaches. So that's, that's a, you know, a, a reality that we're trying to make people aware of. We obviously, you know, it, uh, beach renourishment has its own problems. Um, not only is it costly and not only are we running out of sand, um, but you know, if it's done at the wrong time of year, if it's not you know, done properly, it can be very problematic for sea turtles too, but it is definitely the lesser of some other evils that are out there in terms of what people do to control erosion. So we really try to support beach nourishment in the right, done the right way. Um, but uh, you know, in, in on developed shorelines like we have in Florida, what's happening and what will continue happening is sea turtles are gonna be squeezed into smaller and smaller pocket beaches. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, very long term, I mean, beyond our lifetimes, um, beaches will continue to exist. They'll, the water will get past buildings, it'll get past the walls and new sandy shorelines will appear maybe behind what we, you know, A1A, you know, in geological terms, the beach will find a way. Um, but uh, in, in the near term, uh, it's going to get really difficult for sea turtles in Florida. Uh, and, and so we, you know, we're trying to advocate for things like managed retreat from the coast in some areas. 
You know, that there uh, that's a difficult concept to get people to listen to. And we've been using managed retreat, that phrase for 15 years. And people would just look at you like managed retreat. Are you kidding? <laughs> but now you talk about it, even with, you know, uh, fairly conservative legislators are going, you know, managed retreat might not be a bad idea. So, you know, these things are going to become a necessity. You know, you're going to be retreating one way or another in Florida. And, uh, but anyway, yeah, it's complicated. And um, we're, we're trying to promote um, uh, the best options possible. Thank you. Well, it looks like we actually are at time and I know folks are, are busy and, and need to scoot. Lisa, do you think we... Yeah, we anybody see? else has a burning question? Um, we'll, right. I'll, I'll go ahead and let you uh, wrap it up, Teresa. All right. Well... Oh, oh. oh one more question. Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> go ahead, Peter. I have one more question, if, if I might. Uh, do we have any idea when we when we put a device on the back of a turtle if that device um is unattractive to uh the opposite sex turtle um the only way to answer that is that we have lots of turtles that we've put devices on that come back and nest successfully in a couple of years uh and that that's normal but a, a turtle does not nest every year a single they skip a year or two but we see them all the time back on the beach, nesting successfully, sometimes with the transmitter still attached. So, um, and, and, and they're viable eggs. So somebody found it attractive or, or didn't mind. But didn't it's mind not, the extra it's, bling. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not a barrier to nest, to mating. It's not a barrier to feeding or to migrating. Um, and apparently it's not a, an attractiveness barrier either. <laughs> 